character creation a deep dive. In the previous video we touched upon tiers. Tiers are there to keep a level of balance in the game and are there to avoid players creating something that could feel overpowered or underwhelming. Naturally, with any tabletop role playing game there are going to be ways to min max and players who build towards this, but overall there are systems in place to help avoid scenarios where certain instances could end up sucking the fun out of your game. The tier system is one of these. It gives you a bracket of archetypes that you can choose from that will fit well together. Before beginning the character creation process, make sure you're aware of what tier of play your GM wants the adventure to sit at. This will shorten the list of available archetypes to you. Of course, there are ways around it. You can always pick from a lower tier, but not necessarily without express permission from your GM and a lot of tweaking from a higher one. When you begin the character creation process, you gain a set amount of experience points to spend on things like species, traits, attributes, skills and psychic powers. The amount of experience points is dependent on the tier that's in place, seen in the table found on page 20 of the core rulebook. On occasion, your GM will tell you a different amount of XP to start with. This could be because he wants the adventure to feel particularly gruelling or to make your team feel elite. Some of the descriptions and requirements will have keywords. Keywords are almost always a representation of the required quality your character needs in order to select or use that particular item, skill or archetype. As an example, the Sister Hospitaler archetype has the keyword Imperium, meaning that she can only hail from the Imperium, and therefore not be an Orc or Eldari. You'll see that she also has a bracketed keyword. Bracketed keywords are placeholders, and are meant to be adjusted as you fill out your character sheet. In this example, you're meant to take the bracketed keyword Order and replace it with the relevant order she hails from. This could be one of the official orders from the Gilead system, like the Order of the Sanctified Shield, or with help with your GM, you could come up with your own. You'll see here that the archetype offers some suggested attributes, skills and talents. You don't need to take these necessarily, but they are useful to look at as a starting point. At the time of creating this video, there are eight species to pick from, in both the core rulebook, page 29, and the Forsaken System Player's Guide, page 90. In the core rulebook, these are human, Eldari, Orc, and the two Space Moon species, the Adeptus Astartes and the Primaris Astartes. And introduced in the Forsaken Systems Player's Guide are the Kroot, Ogrins, and Ratlings. All species, bar the human, have an experience cost associated with them. Please note that your archetype experience cost will have your species cost built into it, so please don't double up on the experience cost when choosing your archetype. This species experience cost is simply listed here for advanced character creations that don't use archetypes. As touched upon in the keyword section, you'll also have the choice to pick a faction. As we've discussed in my example before, you could choose to pick a number of already established factions out of the Gilead system as your faction, or you could choose to create your own. If you choose not to do so, you still get an overarching keyword to use found on page 38 of the core rulebook. You can use these to customise your own order, craft world or chapter, for example. Let's talk about archetypes. There are a total of some 27 in the core rulebook and an extra 20 odd in the Forsaken System Player's Guide. I'm not going to go into full detail and analyse them in this video, but let's take a look from a character building point of view. In fact, let's walk through a character build as we go. So I'm going to build an Eldari Corsair. Remember, the cost of your archetype comes pre-baked with the cost of your species built in. Your archetype will essentially dictate your species this way, as archetypes are built with a specific species in mind. It also comes with an archetype ability and also a selection of starter war gear. You also get given attributes and skills as part of your archetype, which you can add to your character sheet. So you've got your tier and your archetype, and next we need to work out our attributes and skills. All of your character's attributes begin at 1. It's important to note that if you're doing everything old fashioned and on the original character sheet, do this in pencil, as you'll be working back and forth to really balance your character. There's a lot to take in here, so don't feel too intimidated and overwhelmed if it doesn't sink in on the first go. I suggest pausing at times and re-listening if something seems unclear. Before you start putting points and things, it's important to first understand the typical competencies and their relating dice values. As you can see in the table here, as an example, the amount of attribute and skill you have relates to your competency in that test and that can be quite useful if you're looking to build a character to be talented in something. I would say now though, that because of the Tree of Learning system, you will find it, and rightly so, 
difficult to make a character with the silly high numbers of dice pools in one skill. It's useful to note that there are species maximums when it comes to attributes. You can surpass this value with powers, augments and items in the form of attribute bonuses, but note that your base value cannot exceed these maximums. These values can be found on page 25 and are seen here. As part of the species you have picked, you'll find that you have been granted attribute and skill values already. You can put these into your sheet as a starting point. You can also add the species abilities to your sheet as well. Before we fill out the character sheet properly though, let's go over each skill, attribute and trait and give you a brief example of what they do. Knowing what they do can help build the character to the idea that you have in your mind. Attributes represent your character's innate abilities, and normally, you only roll the attribute value in dice when making an associated test. Strength is your physical power. This affects the damage on your melee attacks, your lifting, and in some cases, wielding heavy weapons. Toughness is your endurance and resistance to disease and toxins. It also determines how much damage you can take before you're down. Agility is your dexterity and coordination. This directly affects your ability to shoot well and the control you have of your movement. Initiative covers your reflexes and your reaction speed and directly affects your hitting skills in combat. Willpower is your mental fortitude. It helps resist temptations, warp corruptions and illusions. It also helps with keeping your mind intact in survival situations. Intelligence is your skill in retaining, processing and applying information. This includes for medicine, history or technology. And fellowship is in essence charisma, the measure of your personality. You might be able to read people better, be persuasive, charm, lie, and in turn notice deceit. For these abilities, a rating of around 1 is considered subpar, 2 is basic, 3 and 4 is considered great, and 5 and 6 is considered exceptional. Skills represent a character's experience or learned skills. When making a dice roll associated to a skill, you roll the skill value and the associated attribute as the total dice pool. The associated attribute is seen on the character sheet next to the skill as an abbreviation. Athletics is using your physical strength to run, jump or swim, or make interaction attacks. Awareness is associated with noticing things, including people trying to hide or hidden objects. Ballistic skill is your skill with firearms and goes towards your ranged attack value. Cunning is your ability to find contacts in the black markets or illicit gangs in the local area. Deception is the skill for untruthfulness, lying and bending the truth. Insight is the ability to pick up on social cues and possible deceptions of intent. Intimidation is the ability to frighten or forcibly coerce someone to do something against their will. Investigation is your skill at deciphering clues, assembling information and performing research with it. Leadership is your ability to inspire those around you or lead people into tough situations. Medicaid is useful for diagnostics or healing or working out conditions or deaths. Persuasion is your ability to sway people to your side through diplomacy. Pilot is your ability to control vehicles, both flying and land-based. Psychic mastery is the ability to control psychic powers and is only available to psychers or someone with the psychic keyword. Scholar is the ability to recall knowledge from your studies, such as geographical law or the history of a house. Stealth is the ability to hide and not be noticed. It's also used to disable tricky security systems. Survival is your ability to withstand hostile or natural environments. Tech is the ability to repair, use, understand or dismantle technology. And weapon skill is your skill at unarmed and armed close combat. This affects your melee hits. There's also traits. These aren't skills per se, but are values related to tests you may take that derive from your attribute or skill values. There are combat traits. Defence is your ability to dodge blows or bullets. It's how hard you are to hit. It's worked out by initiative rating minus one. Attackers will be rolling against this value to hit you. Resilience represents the amount of injuries or blows that you can withstand. It's calculated by your toughness plus one. Any armour rating from armour is added to this. This value absorbs the equivalent amount of damage a successful hit would have caused to you. Wounds represents how many injuries you can take before you fall. Your maximum wounds is calculated by double your tier plus your toughness. Determination is the ability to continue despite the damage you have taken. It is equal to your toughness rating. Shock determines how much mental trauma you can suffer before becoming exhausted. It's your willpower rating plus your tier. You then have the mental traits. Corruption is a measure of how warped you have become from tainted influences. Conviction is the same as your willpower rating and is used to try and resist corruption. 
Uh, resolve is your morale and courage. You begin with a value equal to your willpower minus one to a minimum of one. Passive awareness is your ability to notice unusual things without actively looking for them. Your passive awareness is equal to half your awareness skill rounded up. And lastly, there are the social traits. Influence is the social trait used for exploiting authority in civilized environments, for favors, orders, or acquiring items. Your starting influence is equal to your fellowship rating, minus one. Wealth is the measure of your wealth, be it throne geld, creds, or weapons and armor. Your starting wealth is equal to your tier, and you can spend one XP point at character creation to improve your wealth by one, up to a total of four. Okay, now we've gone over the attributes, skills, and traits, let's fill in our character sheet. There's species-specific bonuses that should be added first to the attributes, so we'll do that. It's time to explain what the Tree of Learning is. Sorry, there's quite a lot to take in, but these systems are in place to help avoid too much min-maxing and balances the characters for decent gameplay. The rule of the Tree of Learning is this. You must have points in a number of skills as the highest rating your character has in a single skill. As an example, if you have an athletics rating of 4, you must have points in at least three other skills. It's now time to input our skills and attribute points. There's a calculation to keep in mind here, and it's slightly different for attributes and skills. Luckily, the core rulebook supplies these tables as a reference. Now I'll use the attribute cost and skill cost tables to calculate the experience I need to build my character. All whilst keeping in mind the tree of learning and the species maximums as well. Here are all four reminders on the screen for you right now for convenience. Feel free to pause the video right here and soak it all in, or use this screen to help as a reminder as you fill in your character sheet. Keep in mind that if you're creating a Psyker, you'll need to keep back the required experience points to buy both the Psychic Mastery points to obtain a slot for a spell, and the spell itself, which requires set experience points to buy. I'll talk more on this specifically later in the video. The same goes for if you wish to cast any Acts of Faith. There's an entire section dedicated to your appearance and age, and you're welcome to take a look. It offers random roll tables for things like this, but if you have something in mind, feel free to stick to what you like. There's also a section on things to think about of your past and your personality too. During character creation, and in some cases tests using talents and dice rolls, you'll be asked to add your rank. Your rank, for want of a better term, is the cumulative experience your character has accumulated at this particular tier. It's almost like a mini tier, you begin at rank 1, and then rank 2 when you have achieved a total of 40 experience, finally capping at rank 3 for 80 experience. The core cool rulebook then suggests that you ascend by increasing the tier of the character, but this is at your GM's discretion. There are a lot of talents to choose from, and the core cool rulebook handily groups these all together in their own chapter. I'm going to be frank, there's a lot of controversy here in spending experience points on talents over min-maxing your skills. Personally, I like the flavour of a talent or two, and I would advise having one or two just to keep your character flavourful and grounded, rather than min-maxing your character and possibly creating an imbalance between you and your fellow players. I won't go through all of them here, there are way too many, but I highly advise you take an evening to read through them all and take one or two that you like the sound of. Some require specific species to take, or a minimum of a certain attribute, so be wary that you won't have access to all of them. Let's talk about picking psychic powers. Part of building a character could involve creating a Psyker. Building a Psyker isn't as complicated as you think, and I'll go over more into casting Psychic Powers in a future video. For now, let's discuss how you add Psychic Powers to your character whilst you build it. To be a Psyker, you need to have the Psyker keyword. There are a couple of ways to get this. The first is simply to pick an archetype that allows you to be a Psyker, such as the Astropath. This means that the cost of becoming a Psyker is factored into the points of the archetype. The second is to be an Eldari. All Eldari have the option of taking the Psycho keyword as part of their species options. This is called Psychosensitive. So you've now got the Psycho keyword and you're ready to pick your starting spells. All Psychers gain the two universal Psychic abilities, Deny the Witch and Cynescience. For every point in Psychic Mastery that you have, you may learn another Psychic spell. You also have to invest the experience required to buy the Psychic power that you want to learn. Any Psycho can learn from the minor Psychic powers list and Smite but you are limited to one discipline. Unless, of course, you are an Aladari or invest in the Warped Mind talent. Feel free to look through the psychic powers and take your pick. As I've said, I'll talk about these powers later in another video. You might not be a Psyker, but that doesn't mean you can't have access to mysterious powers. If you choose to take a Faith talent, you gain access to the Faith abilities. 
These are restricted to the members of the Imperium, however. Whenever you take a Faith Talent, you gain a Faith Point. These are spent to perform that particular act of Faith, and are restored at the start of a new session. Purchasing Acts of Faith works like Psychic Powers, and has a set experience points cost depending on the act of Faith you wish to buy. In a nutshell, War Gear is the weapons, armour and equipment that your character has. War Gear can have key red restrictions or rarity restrictions, meaning you might not be able to acquire them upon character creation, or at all. As with Psychic Powers, I'm going to just offer advice for War Gear on a character building perspective. I'll cover War Gear more specifically in another video later. Your archetype entry will offer you a few items to begin with. Here, I've been building an Eldari Corsair, which means I get access to Corsair Armor, a Shuriken Pistol, a Laz Blaster, a Spirit Stone, three Plasma Grenades, and a Void Suit. The Corsair Armor has an AR, or Armor Rating, of three, which will be added to the Resilience value of my character to give me my total resilience. It's important to note here that you don't necessarily need to stick with your starting gear. Sure, it's recommended, but speak to your GM. Discuss the ideas you have with your character. Maybe you can have a mastercrafted las pistol that's an heirloom handed down from your father. Maybe you're a melee killing machine mercenary and carry a chainsword or chain axe. It's good to have these discussions, but don't get too disheartened if you get denied something. It's all a balancing game, and there's no reason why you can't work towards finding something like this in the future as part of your development. Now it's time to pick your backgrounds and objectives. These may sound a little trivial, but it can be quite the opposite. Your objectives can actually offer you a point of wrath should you complete them mid-session. Backgrounds are not really just your past. Backgrounds are a specific event that shapes your character in a way that affects your character beyond just the story. There are background, origin and objective tables within the core rulebook that offer bonuses that are broken down based on your chosen faction. If these do not suit what your character has in mind, however, feel free to discuss your plans with your GM and work on a solution together, offering different bonuses or a different objective that offers the same benefits from one of the official backgrounds or objectives. After this, we're practically done. So here's my finished character sheet. There's a handy summary of the character sheet that you can find on page 40 of the core rulebook if you get stuck. If you don't fancy picking an archetype and instead fancy building your own character completely from scratch, you can. This is called Advanced Character Creation, and it has its own dedicated section in the core rulebook. Because you're not picking an archetype, instead you receive bonus experience equal to the selected tier of play multiplied by 10. If you wish to purchase an ability from an archetype, you can do so. Its experience cost is equal to the archetype's tier multiplied by 10. Otherwise, you can simply follow the previous steps to create your character as usual, keeping in mind that you have to pay the experience cost for a certain race. I hope you found this character creation deep dive to be useful. Next we will discuss the D6 dice system, Wrath, Glory, Ruin, Tests, Shifting and Critical and Complications tables. In essence, the base mechanics of the game and taking tests. Thanks for listening.